enthusiasm of uh, Buharan and Radek for this uh, um, united front or possible popular front uh, that they thought might be organized in Europe, you know, organize all of the parties, all the political parties across the spectrum against fascism and uh, compete with the bestial philosophy uh, that way and, um, and engage in this immense struggle as they, as they made the argument. And then we said the uh, British betrayed that, uh, that line with the Anglo-German naval pact. So the popular front line should be associated not simply with this domestic strategy for the common turn parties, the popular front line, but uh, we ought to think of it in terms of the Bartu Laval diplomatic offensive on the part of the French. The fact that the French made a big attempt here uh, between 1934 and five, they made a big attempt to form a diplomatic block around, um, around that's all it was, a diplomatic block around uh, Nazi Germany and to force them into a treaty of self-abnegation, basically, an Eastern Locarno as uh, Bartu like to put it. So that's quite an extraordinary thing that the French uh, tried to do there against Nazism. It's the probably the most important campaign. They tried to include Mussolini's, uh, a role for Mussolini against Hitler. And remember that uh, Mussolini opposed Hitler on Austria at this point, so uh, maybe he was recruitable. And uh, also they had the idea that they wanted to include uh, the French. So you can't say that the Soviet line of the Popular Front and support for the French, you can't say that that uh, was defeated by the French. They played their role, I think, in the whole thing. But it was torpedoed uh, by the Anglo-German uh, Naval Pact. That's kind of an important step, important moment in all of this. And, and of course, I'm describing all this stuff while we're looking at, uh, at Molotov, because Molotov is the one who thinks that all the things we're talking about, are, it's all a lot of nonsense. You can't play ball with the imperialists and get some kind of a block that is going to really successfully uh, defend the Soviet Union against the Nazis. The only way you can survive uh, is by making peace with the Nazis and hoping maybe they'll go in the, the other direction, go somewhere else and fight somebody else. Have to make peace with them, have to come to terms with them. That's the line of, um, of Molotov. And that line, of course, it wins out pretty much by 1936. Why does Molotov's line went out? I think on account of the Anglo-German naval pact. So that's a important sentence there. Um, Molotov's line wins out in the Soviet Union over the pro-French line of Buharin and Radek and all the other people who are going to be shot uh, in the purges, 1936 to 1938. It wins out uh, because of the Anglo-German Naval Pact. The Anglo-German Naval Pact has uh, enormous implications all over the world as well. Well, for one thing, in Europe, Mussolini uh, drew the conclusion, once the Germans had marched into the Rhineland, uh, drew the conclusion that the British and the French are not going to oppose Germany. Why should he uh, be left opposing Germany all alone? Mm, this makes sense. Um, um, if he's opposing Germany and the British and the French are not, uh, compare the way he acted toward the Nazi impositions on Austria with the way the British and the French acted vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Nazi impositions on the Rhineland. Big difference. So Mussolini now reaching the point where if other people are not going to cooperate in any of this, I don't want to do it all alone. So Mussolini starts thinking about uh, the commonality he shares with Hitler from this point on. And he's going to go closer and closer to Hitler. Now, as you know, he was really thinking of himself as very independent of Hitler and indeed perhaps opposed to Hitler uh, and offering a different version of fascism and everything that goes with that. And we talked a good deal about that. So let's not uh, believe that, believe that point. Um, but from this point on, uh, Mussolini is going to go more and more. And by 1938, uh, the Nazis will grab Austria and uh, Mussolini won't say a word about it. But just let it pass. So that's a huge difference in Italian foreign policy from 1934 to 1938. How do you account for the difference? Well, I could give an elaborate explanation um, to account for that difference. Uh, but the first line in the paragraph that I would offer about that would be uh, uh, the Anglo-German, would have something to do with the Anglo-German Naval Pact. So the Anglo-German Naval Pact, very important in Europe. 
it, it essentially turns Mussolini uh, from a, a, an enemy of Hitler's to a friend. Um, and then you have to say in the Far East, the same thing happens, that uh, Japan uh, starts to take note of all these events in Europe and starts to draw the conclusion that the, the English are part of a bloc that is forming that is friendly to Germany and that uh, maybe they'll be part of it as well. And if they do, and they will do that in 1936, uh, the Anti-Comintern Pact will link Japan and Germany. Uh, when they do that, uh, that will essentially bring them into a block, they think, a block that includes England and that includes Poland. So it might be an Anglo, German, Polish, Japanese, anti turn pact. Now they say anti turn meaning it's against communism. But naturally, of course, if you say against communism, you're probably saying against the Soviet Union as well. So all those things happen as a result, I think, of the Anglo-German naval pact. And I think it deserves our attention, uh, our attention for that reason. Um, but we uh, especially have to concern ourselves with the things that are going on in Russia and how this affects the purges. So Radek and Buharin are definitely left out in the cold by the Anglo-German Naval Pact, makes their whole pro-French line look very silly uh, and dangerous, as a matter of fact. And we're going to get essentially that argument from Molotov, who's going to be whispering it in Stalin's ear, ear that these people are leading you into trouble. I mean, not only do they oppose you in Russia, or that is, they both have a, a record of having opposed Stalin uh, in Russia, opposing his leadership. So, I mean, that's right away. Uh, Stalin is not tremendously well disposed toward them in the first place. Uh, not only do they oppose Stalin in Russia, oppose his leadership, but the foreign policy that they're advocating is going to get Russia, or I should say the Soviet Union, going to get it involved in a big war. Uh, and uh, so not only are these people, you know, disloyal, unworthy, uh, treacherous, etc., but they're dangerous. <laughs> they're dangerous to the Soviet state. So that's going to be the argument that Molotov is going to make. I'm not making this up. Molotov uh, wrote articles on this in Pravda. You can read them and, you know, there they are. He lays the whole line out. You can't do the things that Buharin and Radek have been suggesting vis-a-vis -vis the imperialists. And uh, they're to, to suggest these things is, a, is very dangerous for the Soviet Union. So, so that is a line essentially that um, is going to be um, prevalent, I think, from this point on. It is not immediately obvious. Uh, you know, you have to figure these things out from the writings uh, of the, most of these leaders, mainly in Pravda, because Izvestia is under the editorship of Bukharin. So it's not easy to tell exactly what's going on in the Soviet leadership from what you see in his vestia. But when, when you read it in Pravda uh, during these words, Pravda is a party organ, of course, and his vestia is the, is the organ of the state apparatus, and Bukharin's the editor. Um, so, so if you read, it, uh, read Pravda rather than, S, uh, than um, his vestia, uh, you, I think, get the line of the party. And uh, that's where Molotov really shines. Uh, his articles seem very, very sharp. And they seem to be the line that the party is starting to adopt. And that means, of course, the line that, that uh, Stalin is going to be adopted. So from this point on, Stalin's going to be ranged, I think, against these uh, these opposition figures, uh, figures form formerly in the opposition right now, they're friends of Stalin, but of course Stalin is turning against them. And um, that causes us to consider, hmm, this picture didn't turn out as well as I'd hoped. Should have included more of Kirov, but I have a couple of other pictures of Kirov, which will give us an idea. Oh, dearie. Um, only a little bit. There's a good picture of Kirov, another good picture of Kirov with Stalin. So at least we have we have something there. So uh, let's go back to the affair of Ryutin, Martemyan Ryutin, who in 1932 wrote a large document, book-sized document. I've actually seen this thing. Um, highly critical of Stalin, as it says, as it says here. And um, especially for the last part of it, in which he calls Stalin the evil genius of the Russian Revolution, um, he said Buharin had been right in matters of economic policy and, and Trotsky right in matters of inter-party democracy. That's interesting. Both Buharin and Trotsky, Buharin presumably for the right of the party, Trotsky for the left, 
both of them been right against Stalin, uh, was what uh, Ryutin said. And he said, more than that, Stalin's the evil genius of the Russian Revolution. Um, he's building up a cult with a personality. Lenin said you had to remove Stalin, time to remove him. Um, so there it is, uh, the Ryutin, Ryutin program. Now, this is not widely disseminated and it's hardly even known about in, in Russia, but you can pick up inklings of it in the Soviet press, a discussion of it, and especially the Central Party uh, plenum that met at the end of 1932 and that apparently considered their Ryutin program. But of course, uh, the way it considered it, uh, Stalin brought up the idea that uh, the Ryutin program was opposed to the party leadership and Ryutin ought to put on, be put on trial and possibly shot. Um, for for authoring this document. Not only should the document be suppressed, but administrative action should have been taken against the Ryutin. The party rose up on its hind legs about this. It's the end of 1932, this is, and the party stopped him. So uh, inside the Politburo, Stalin find, found he couldn't get a majority uh, for this campaign against the Ryutin. What does that tell us about the character of the Stalin leadership in the Soviet Union at this point? Is he a dictatorship, dictator, and despot and personal leader. Certainly he shows every inkling of going in that direction, but has he reached the full pinnacle of personal power um, by this time? I don't think you can say that. I don't think you can say that. And uh, it's uh, measured by the fact that he can't get his way against the oppositionists. He can't do anything he wants against the oppositionists. And uh, how about this leadership in the party, which was general in the, um, or I should say this opposition to the persecution of Ryutin um, in 1932. Uh, it's, it's most of the Politburo. So in effect, these people have been supporting Stalin. It's a revolt among the Stalinists uh, against the full Stalinism. And Molotov's not part of this. Molotov took the view that one has to support Stalin. And once you say A, you have to say B. And then that means, in effect, you have to do whatever is necessary. Uh, to give Stalin whatever he wants, you know, the rule rule of the country without any genuine limit. So let's call that despotism if we like, or tyranny, or use some some good word from our civics language um, to describe that char the character of that dictatorship. Molotov's all for it, um, and he takes the view that uh, um, Stalin's got to be given his way on this. Uh, but they lose on the matter at the end of 1932. So the Ryutin program failed. Um, all right, so that's back in 1932. Now we're taking the thing up in 1936, but between 32 and 36, a couple of other interesting things ought to be taken note of. So I think we ought to consider the fact that Trotsky is writing about all these things, gets wind of most of these things, and even participates in a very small degree um, in these affairs. Uh, this can be uh, documented from the, the uh, materials in the Trotsky archive, the special exile archive, which was closed um, until the 1980s and was finally open. And Trotsky figured there were a lot of people involved in this correspondence that's in that archive that uh, were still going to be alive for the next few years. And so he wanted to, he said, you, you couldn't open it up for 40 years. He sold his archive to Harvard University Library in 1940. And he said, you can't open it up until 40 years have passed. Well, they, 40 years passed, and then scholars, people like me, uh, jumped in there and started reading all this stuff. We found out Trotsky was involved with the Ryutin program in kind of an indirect way. He um, sent correspondence to a number of meetings. Uh, there were meet, and these are mostly meetings in people's apartments. You know, we're not talking about mass meetings and huge mobilizations of opposition to Stalin. They're just rumblings and grumblings. But um, among many prominent people in the party, you practically would draw the conclusion uh, from this evidence that almost everybody, you know, there's some exceptions, but almost everybody, including Stalinists uh, in the top leadership of the party, uh, was worried about Stalin and a, pers a threat of a personal dictatorship. Interesting, interesting thing for us to note. And it tells us a lot about uh, why the purges developed the way they, the way they did. 
nobody wanted Stalin. If Stalin was going to be the Vosht, the leader, the Duce, um, the Fuhrer of the, um, of the Soviet Union, uh, he was going to have to overcome a lot of opposition. And he certainly did, did overcome it. So that's what we're talking about right, right now. Well, um, a lot of this opposition crystallized around the figure of Sergei Kirov, Leningrad First Party Secretary. Um, Kirov was uh, uh, very close to Stalin. You can't say Kirov was any kind of critic of Stalin's. Um, a number of scholars, and I'm one of them, have poured through uh, the documentary materials on this, and we can't find an inkling um, uh, that Kirov ever criticized Stalin. Okay, so there, there it is, even though he was widely regarded as an alternative to Stalin. That's a different thing. Widely regarded as an alternative uh, to Stalin, meaning all the critics of Stalin would have liked to push Stalin aside if they could have figured a way to do it. And uh, the person they would have looked to probably would have been Kirov. And there are a number of indications uh, that uh, uh, this um, attitude toward Kirov is a kind of successor to Stalin. The hope of him being an alternative to Stalin surfaced in the press and surfaced in a couple of party meetings um, in 1933 and 1934. So much so that Kirov, as head of Leningrad, uh, got instructions to come to Moscow, be part of the Moscow leadership. Not sure exactly what that means, but maybe it means he's not going to be a regional figure from this point on. This is in 1934. Not going to be a regional figure from this point on and probably might be in the top leadership, might be the top leadership, some people must have thought at that time. I think a large number of people in the leadership. And I don't think this penetrates very far into Soviet society. I don't think you, we, can, we can make this generalization about the Soviet people, about all of this stuff. In fact, very difficult, um, very difficult to make a, a proper determination, or something you can quantify about the attitudes of the Soviet people toward all these leadership questions. But in the top leadership, I think there was a feeling that maybe Kirov is an alternative uh, to Stalin. And Stalin, of course, was well aware, <laughs> well aware of that. Well, so Kirov is assassinated in 1934. Mysterious thing. Follower of Zinoviev, turns out. Um, person who'd read some of the criticisms, apparently, of the Stalin leadership, but decided to take it out on Kirov. Uh, killed Kirov. Uh, at any rate, that's what the press announced to the people. Kirov was shot in Leningrad before he had departed for Moscow. So that alternative to Stalin disappeared. Well, ever since this point, scholars have been kicking around the idea uh, that um, Stalin ordered Kirov's death, ordered him to be killed. I, you can certainly understand uh, why they would do this. I mean, the death of Kirov was a boon. Uh, it removed the possibility of a real alternative to Stalin. So you can see where Stalin might have an interest or might be happy, might secretly gloat, might even think, uh, to see Kirov uh, removed in this way. Um, but where's the evidence? Uh, if we do say this, and the skeptic comes forward, and there are plenty of skeptics naturally, all, all historical questions come up against the arguments of skeptics. Uh, if the skeptics come forward and they ask us about the death of Kirov, um, we don't know what to say. It's funny that when the archives were finally thrown open in uh, briefly thrown open in uh, 1987 during the Gorbachev regime. And when they first had started having public meetings about the past, you got to talk about all these things that we're talking about now that Soviet people didn't exactly, weren't exactly well informed about up to this point. Um, when the, um, when the, um, the discussion of it was permitted, nearly always uh, any meeting that talked about the Soviet past during the question period uh, there would come up, the first question, let me say, who killed Kirov? Did Stalin kill Kirov? Nobody could give a proper answer to this. Well, at any rate, an answer that had documents, uh, an answer that one could um, 
assert against the skeptic and produce evidence about it. And that's what historians are interested in. Now, there are a number of books on this topic, but none of them, not one of them, and even some of them are pretty good. Amy Knight's book on the assassination of Kirov, well worth reading. Um, and, but even those who know a lot about it uh, cannot really produce the clinching evidence that Stalin ordered or set up um, the assassination of Kirov. Now you might say, what do you think anyhow? Now, this comes up frequently when we talk about this or that thing that is asserted about Putin's leadership in Russia today. Uh, you know, we haven't got evidence. The Russians deny whatever it is. You know, they deny it. Uh, they, 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 well, what do you think? What do you think? I'm not, you know, as a historian, imagine yourself uh, being asked this. Um, what do you think? Um, uh, they're not asking what would you conclude about this in public in a document at a conference testifying in court or something like that they're not asking that uh, they're saying what are you thinking when you know when you go to bed and you think it over or when you, when you sit around and um, sip your coffee uh, what do you you know what do you really think happened uh, and, and uh, you know if anybody asked that me that about Kirov, i think stalin killed him uh, or at any rate that I have to put it this way, that's the most uh, interesting and intriguing hypothesis. Anybody who goes into the topic, that's the first question they're going to have to answer. Did Stalin do it? Okay, so that's where we have to leave the matter. Um, and there are a number of things like that having to do with the Soviet Union. Um, assertions that are made, suggestions that are made, uh, and then uh, the, there's an official denial on a certain part, or at least a, a denial of a certain partisan of a participant in the event. And, uh, and then someone comes to us and says, well, what do you think? Uh, it practically comes down to where are your loyalties on this matter? That's really they're asking you. Where are your loyalties? Do you trust so-and-so? Do you believe so-and-so? These are not things that historians not things that historians really should be doing, in my opinion. They have to deal with things they can demonstrate. They have to have a, a sense of judgment. They have to argue points that can be proven to the skeptic. Um, they can't go off half-cocked and assert all sorts of things that they only feel in their, in their gut. Um, so this is the problem we have with a number of things in Soviet history, and this is one of the big ones, uh, the assassination, the assassination of Kirov. What did Bukharin think of it all? Now, Bukharin's in good graces with the leadership when this happens, December 1934. He wrote an article in his Vestia, and he said, uh, oh, yes, he said, uh, Nikolaev, and that's the, the unfortunate character who carried out the killing, uh, Nikolaev uh, did it, we know that, and uh, Nikolaev was sympathetic uh, to Zinoviev and Kamenev, was reading Zinoviev and Kamenev, and as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, he's under the influence of Zinoviev and Kamenev, that makes Zinoviev and Kamenev guilty. Imagine Buharin talking like this. Oh, we have the idea that Buharin is such a gentle character, and he's such a sweet fellow and a moderate fellow, and, uh, and uh, such an alternative, many historians say, uh, to Stalin. That's all wrong, in my opinion. That's all wrong about Buharn. Buharn wrote it, and it's in print, in, in, in an article in Investia called Stern Words. And in this article, he accuses Zinoviev and Kamenev of really being the culprits. And he even provides a motive. He says that the reason they did it was that they opposed the pro-French line. They opposed the line of foreign policy that he, Buharin, advocated, this pro-French line we've been describing. So he kind of accuses them of the thing that we're going to say Molotov is arguing. And he says that's the real reason they decided to carry out terror. So he associates this difference in foreign policy with carrying out terror in the Soviet Union. Wow. <laughs> this is certainly our stern words, no getting, no getting around it. Um, so Bohorin's role in this is, hmm, 
very, very interesting for us to take note of. In fact, the way he puts it on the assassination of Kirov in December 1934, this is practically the way the Moscow trials are going to put it in 1936 and 37, uh, when they start putting all the major leaders on trial and accusing them of all sorts of nefarious acts. And among them, almost always it was thrown in, oh yes, they uh, were involved in this assassination of Kirov. It's going to be charged, and that's why they're all going to be shot. That's going to be the big centerpiece, the ideology, you, you, uh, Soviets would probably say, the ideology of the purges. Who made the ideology of the purges? Maybe Buharin could probably say Buharin. And more than that, he gives a very colorful figure um, to uh, describe the actions of Zinoviev and Kamenev. He says they are the Charlotte Cordays of the Russian Revolution. Charlotte Corday. Um, is uh, in this famous uh, painting uh, of uh, the death of Marat, uh, who's lying in the bathtub. He had a skin disease, a very uh, French revolutionary, famous tribune of the people. Charlotte Corday uh, comes in, she stabs him, the blood runs over the top of the tub. And uh, that's this famous painting by Angre of, uh, of, uh, of Charlotte Corday's murderous act against the French Revolution. So Charlotte Corday, a literary figure of murder and treachery against the revolution. Zinoviev and Kamenev are the Charlotte Cordays of the Russian Revolution. Wow. So Bukharin, mm, stern stuff indeed. And um, in my opinion, this is an indication of the ideology of the purges, as we will see um, in a minute or two. Well, at any rate, Stalin's line, I don't think we can generalize about Stalin's line, but we can at least say what Molotov is saying about it. We know that uh, when the Nazis marched into the Rhineland in March of 1936, Molotov gave an interview to a Parisian paper, uh, Le Mo uh, not Le Monde, uh, um, Le Temps, uh, the Times, um, he gave a, uh, an interview to this paper, and he said, uh, you know, many people take the view that uh, the um, uh, Soviet foreign policy is anti-Nazi, anti-German. He said, but um, uh, you shouldn't draw that conclusion. Uh, he says, uh, there's a debate going on in the Soviet Union. There are two positions, aren't there? Some in the Soviet leadership who don't feel that way. Well, that's, that was an extraordinary statement that he made to the Western press, Molotov this is, an extraordinary statement that he made to the Western press that there was a division in the leadership about the foreign policy and that there was a faction, presumably that was friendly to the Soviet Union. He said, uh, the um, uh, Soviets, uh, there is a, a group of people in the Soviet government and Soviet leadership um, uh, that feels that um, some kind of accommodation can be made with Nazi Germany. That's him he's describing. So what he's saying, in effect, is that this argument that you can read in Izvestia through all these years, you know, that Wuhan is laying down, that's not the line, necessarily, and that there's a real opposition that is going to be settled one way or another, we, we know. So that's evident from 1936. Before I rush on to, um, to generalize about, about that and talk, talk about how that unfolds, Let's consider this position that Molotov is arguing to Stalin. And, um, and we know it's all in highly Marxist and Bolshevik language, and Molotov's going to be good at that. Uh, he's going to make this case, in a, not in a way that, that's much different from the way we're making it right now. Um, he's going to be making the ar argument entirely in terms of class forces and um, the revolution, the proletariat, the world proletariat, the threats to the revolution, and you're going to put it all in Marxist language. He's very good at that. Um, but he could have put it in the most conventional diplomatic language, it strikes me. He could have put his case. In fact, he could have said, <laughs> our position is not much different from the position of uh, Tsarist Russia. And we made special reference when we talked about the origins of World War I, um, to the memorandum of P.N. Durnovo, which is mentioned on your outline in 1914, which P.N. Durnovo says essentially, uh, he says a lot of 
things, but essentially he says that um, um, Germ uh, Russia, Tsarist Russia this is, is involved in the wrong alliance. Uh, Tsarist Russia should not be allied with France. Being allied with France means that Tsarist Russia has to fight Germany, the best army in Europe. No, that's, not, that's not in Russian national interest. Russia should have found a way to be allied with, if anything, Germany against France. You know, then Russia wouldn't have to worry about big land battles and everything, everything that World War II brought, or World War I uh, brought to Russia. So many think this is a very prescient, very thoughtful uh, document, certainly is. And it goes on to say that if we do get into a war, Dernavo speaking now in 1914, if we do get into a war, um, there's probably going to be a huge upheaval in Russia, it'd probably be a revolution. And if it's a revolution, Professor Milyukov and the liberals <laughs> probably won't get power. The people who will get power will be the disciples of Karl Marx, and you'll have, you know, genuine overthrow of all the existing order in Russia. Uh, so all that is contained in this famous Dernavo Memorandum of 1914. But of course, it begins with the idea that you don't want to fight Germany. And uh, Dernavo presents that in very lucid and very stunning terms. And I think Molotov is saying almost the same thing now to Stalin. You don't want to fight Germany. Whatever else the regime faces can maybe survive, but not, not a war with Germany. We don't want that. Does anybody else in Europe want that? No, of course not, of course not. Why should we Russians, just because we're communists, just because we hate fascism, which we do, why should we be the ones who have to fight the fascists while others observe? Hmm. So there's the argument of Molotov 1936, not so much different, I would argue. Um, uh, from the argument of P. N. Dernavo in um, in 1914. So, the Rutin affair, that's the end of 1934. Trotsky keeps up a drum fire of criticism throughout this period, the Stalin regime, keeps repeating Lenin's uh, testament and the instructions to remove Stalin. Keeps saying, Lenin's instructions really have to be taken seriously. We have to find a way to remove Stalin. Now, Lenin, I mean, Trotsky is not talking about terror against Stalin. Ah, we do have something on this. I have to brag and say I, I'm the person who found uh, this uh, document in the Trotsky archives, uh, correspondence between Trotsky and his son, Leon Siedov, in which Leon Siedov actually brings up the question of whether they ought to advocate killing Stalin. Imagine the assassination of Stalin. Um, and he says, well, and this is Siedov talking, Siedov the son, talking to Trotsky the father. He says, well, <coughs> we do advocate um, down with the personal regime. We do advocate um, changing the leadership. Uh, we do advocate reduction from, the reduction of this position of Stalin. Uh, as the Germans say, and he does say this in the, in the note to Trotsky, as the Germans say, once you say A, you have to say B. Um, doesn't that mean down with Stalin? Shouldn't we advocate the slogan, down with Stalin? And Trotsky comes back and says, oh, no, no. It's enough to say down with the personal regime. If you say down with Stalin, it's practically some kind of thing that will be taken the wrong way, you know, practically ind indicates that we would look with favor, and we all know they probably would have looked with favor on any kind of attempt on Stalin's life. But no, you don't want to call for that, says Trotsky. The slogan must remain down with the personal regime and not down with Stalin. Uh, people in Russia, people in the Russian leadership will draw the conclusion uh, if we say down with Stalin, they will draw the conclusion that if they allow us back, we're going to come back sword in hand, that we're going to carry out a lot of action against them, administrative action against them, meaning, you know, put them on trial, 
accuse them, throw them in prison, shoot them maybe. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be afraid of all of this stuff. We don't want to make them afraid of us. We can't uh, suggest it slowly. All right, so Trotsky did not advocate um, the killing of Stalin. However, this is a serious correspondence in which they actually do talk about it. The term they use is liquidatsi, <laughs> the liquidation, <laughs> the liquidation of Stalin. That, that's the discussion. Stalin knew about all this stuff. We know that his police uh, got hold of almost all this correspondence and uh, had him very well informed, better informed than any of the people um, that he was watching about their activities, because he knew about all of their activities. Um, and there, he, there Stalin, imagine, uh, if you will, imagine uh, Stalin reading this about Trotsky and his son discussing the question of whether it's politically expedient to offer the slogan that might result in Stalin's assassination. Down with Stalin. Huh. So there it is. There's, uh, we are now trying to put together the building blocks of the thesis of Stalin's paranoia. It is sometimes argued that Stalin was paranoid. That is a term that started to be used after World War II in psychiatry, and it meant fear of everything. Irrational, presumably, fear of everything. Nowadays, we use it to mean uh, fearfulness, just being afraid of something. Uh, paranoia means something more serious. And most people mean exactly that when they talk about Stalin. He's totally paranoid. He thinks everybody's out, everybody's after him. But I think um, maybe we might conclude that no one wanted his leadership. Now, I do not conclude that they wanted to kill him. Do not go. But look at it from Stalin's point of view. He must have thought that if any of these characters who oppose me should have got the word that some general liquidated me, what are they going to say to that general? Tut tut, we didn't have that in mind? No. But to talk about these things is enough. Now, you can say juridically, this is not a case against these people. No, juridically speaking. But trying to understand the period, trying to look at all of the fears and hatreds and everything else that goes through the minds of all of these leaders, maybe we can start to understand a little better uh, why Stalin was so pitted against them to bring about their demise. Now, that I've said that, I'm afraid of practically justifying the purges, and I don't want to do that. In fact, I don't think that makes sense to justify them. I think that a real leader uh, certainly could have lived with people who disliked him, who wanted his, or wanted somebody else rather than him. And certainly, uh, people in the Bolshevik and other movements, any party movement that comes up against this, you've got people who don't like you and uh, would like to replace you. And maybe, they're, and politically speaking, they're your embittered enemies. But it does not have to be described in terms of a criminal conspiracy. Ah, well, that came up very sharply at the end of 1932 uh, in a, uh, two articles describing the plenum. Uh, that defied Stalin and uh, made it impossible for Stalin to put um, Ryutin on trial. Um, and uh, these are two statements by the heads of the Leningrad uh, apparatus, that would be Kirov, and the head of the um, Moscow apparatus, would, this would be Kaganovich. And Kaganovich and Kirov said two different things. Um, Kaganovich said, or I should say Kirov said, about the Ryutin affair, this is, the end of 1932, he said about the Ryutin affair, uh, the Stalin leadership has proven to be superior to everybody. Um, uh, Stalin leadership's line is, is correct. Uh, they're all wrong. Zinoviev was wrong. Baharin's wrong. Trotsky, of course, is wrong. Everybody's wrong. Stalin's right. There's no alternative to Stalin. And more than that, he said the kto kvo, the who whom, that's the way the Russians put it, kto kvo, the who whom, who's going to do it to whom, <laughs> who's going to be the subject of the action and who's going to be the object 
of the action uh, between capitalism and socialism in Russia had been decided as socialism had won as a result of the collectivization, collectivization of agriculture. So since that was the case, what's the point in persecuting all these lesser people um, um, who have opposed Stalin? Uh, let's be magnanimous toward them. Okay, that was a line of Kirov in 1932, vis-a-vis -vis the Ryutin case. But Kaganovich made the opposite line, made the opposite argument. Kaganovich said, no, no, uh, these people have opposed um, politically and they've been defeated. Now that they've been defeated uh, politically, they're going to turn to criminal activities. From this point on, they won't just be arguing, they'll be killing and uh, sabotaging and uh, doing all sorts of illegal stuff, criminal stuff. So the opposition turns to criminality. And he says, the closer you get to socialism, because this is a Marxist, in terms of a Marxist argument, the closer you get to socialism, he says, the more intense the class struggle becomes. I wonder what Karl Marx would say about that argument. Certainly Trotsky thought that was ridiculous. A lot of people think that's ridiculous. I think I think that's ridiculous too. Um, but anyhow, that's the line. So this is another way of saying we need a purge. So we got a number of people calling for purges here at the end of 32. And then of course we get Buharin with the death of Kirov at the end of 34, Charlotte Cordays of the Russian Revolution, blah, blah, blah. People are starting to call for severe action against criminal activity. They're starting to regard criticism of Stalin as something criminal. All right, so Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936. We would love to talk about all the ins and outs of the Spanish Civil War. And I have, I think, um, original things to say from the using the perspective of world politics and especially Russian affairs about the Spanish Civil War that uh, all the brilliant scholars of the Spanish Civil War, um, you know, concentrate on Spain and events in Spain, you know, which they know all about. Uh, maybe they don't consider some of these things and really they could. Um, but we can't do that, that here. We can't talk about the Spanish Civil War, uh, nor the role of the anarchists, nor the, all the important things that have to do with communism and the Spanish Civil War. We have to consider it in terms of all these other questions we're talking about, the Russian Revolution in general, fate of communism, threat of fascism, what's going to happen uh, to Soviet foreign policy. And especially today, we're trying to talk about the purges. So the Spanish Civil War is raging throughout 36. It's a question of whether Soviets will come to the aid. And eventually, they're going to come to the aid of the loyalists in Spain, the people who defend the government and not the fascist revolt by Francisco Franco uh, which was backed up, backed up for the most part by the Nazi powers. In fact, you probably could say that Franco's revolt would have been defeated very quickly, if not for the help of Mussolini, who sent 70,000 troops, and Hitler, who sent all kinds of equipment and advisors and all sorts of, gave all sorts of other, other kinds of help and, and psychological support, everything associated with it. It's hard to imagine Franco, that Franco could have won had it not been for all the help he got from Hitler and Mussolini. And that that's going to cement the relationship between Hitler and Mussolini. If the Anglo-German naval pact hasn't done it, the Spanish Civil War certainly will do it. The question is, what is Russia's position on all of this? Um, the Allies uh, take the view that well, these are all things. <laughs> these are all things we have to be patient about. <laughs> uh, we have to watch and see how it all turns out. You know, they didn't step on it uh, to come to the aid of the loyalists. Quite the reverse. You could argue that the policy of non-intervention uh, that was arrived at by, especially Britain and all all the other powers that uh, Britain influenced, and which with which the United States uh, went along. Uh, this policy of non-intervention uh, worked for the fascists and really helped them a lot. A lot of historians make that, that argument and they've got a point. It, it helped the fascists a lot. Um, Britain, strictly speaking, could have a huge impact in this thing, um, helping out the loyalists by preventing anything 
uh, from coming in to help uh, their opponents. Uh, but it didn't. It, it engaged in non-intervention, and that allowed Hitler and Mussolini to get a lot of stuff in uh, to help out the Spanish uh, by ship. So there is the position of the Allies on that. Not, not very admirable. Then the question, what to do about Zinoviev and Kamenev? They put them on trial in 1936 and accused them of all sorts of things. Uh, well, among them, the assassination of Kirov, following the playbook of Bukharin, the assassination of Kirov. So Zinoviev and Kamenev are going to be on trial. It's going to be a ridiculous trial, uh, no evidence. The uh, confessions of the accused, uh, the only evidence, and the accused saying all sorts of things that can't possibly be swallowed about how they've been opposing uh, Stalin and, and Lenin, opposing Lenin. Ridiculous. Uh, so they say all sorts of ridiculous stuff they, that they couldn't possibly be guilty of. In fact, even the plotting against Stalin, I think, was pretty innocent. Now, I, perhaps I should say weak, pretty weak rather than innocent. They, they simply did not have the wherewithal to oppose Stalin. The discussions in 1932 against Stalin, they're all in people's apartments. You know, at the end of it, they come out and they say, let's publish such and such a bulletin and distribute it secretly. You know, this is not, this is not anything that's going to genuinely threaten Stalin. Yet they absolutely accuse themselves of everything that could be thought of. So these trials are totally put up and ridiculous. Nobody, nobody can take, take them seriously from a juridical point of view. Nobody. Although there are people nowadays who want to build up Stalin's reputation, who make it out that everything they said against themselves would happen to be true. And then what's the evidence? They say, well, they admitted it. Hmm. Hmm, what should we think of that? Well, not much, in my opinion. Um, so, um, Zinoviev and Kamenev put on trial. They're going to be shot within hours of the verdict at the end of this thing, August 1936. And in the course of it, uh, a couple of the um, uh, 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 bits of testimony uh, made reference to Buharin, and Buharin having a role in this. So the question came up immediately in the press. Should there be an investigation to Bohorin? And it was followed by an announcement. Yes, it is a, we started an investigation as to whether uh, Bohorin was just as guilty as these people. Remember, Bohorin is denouncing these people and calling them traitors. Uh, but now it's possible that he may be lumped in with them and that he may get the same treatment they get. Uh, it was about two weeks after that announcement was made uh, that another announcement was made. In fact, the investigation against Barn has, Barn has been dropped. So there was a meeting among the leaders, just like in 1932. There was a meeting among the leaders. They said, are we going to allow the party to shoot Buhar? They said, well, shooting Zinoviev is one thing. Shooting Buharin is another. Huh, that's interesting. So the position of the leadership in 32 was, gee, we don't want to shoot people. Who knows where that'll lead? Now the position in 1936 is, we can shoot the Leningraders, we can shoot Zinoviev and Kamenev, but if we shoot the right, if we shoot Boharin, then they think that's the line. That's what they're saying, in effect. Boharin is the line. They don't know that there's going to be a change of line that's going to make it perfectly permissible to shoot, in fact, necessary. Um, they think, uh, to shoot Buharin. But at any rate, that's their position, 36. And moreover, uh, those meetings that were held uh, on this whole question of the exoneration of Buharin, um, they decided to, to um, intervene in Spain. So that's why the Soviets got involved in helping out uh, the Spanish loyalists against the fascists in Spain. All that happens September, in October of 1936, Soviets get started in Spain. They'll be active in Spain 
for a little less than six months, really. I, actually, they'll have a lot of people there, but I don't think they'll be doing anything very serious against the fascists. Um, they'd be mostly acting against the left in Spain, cleaning up, kind of carrying out in Spain what they're doing in Russia, extending the purge to Spain. But at first, part of the pro-French Bukharan line was to oppose the fascists in Spain, which makes sense to us from the standpoint of anti-fascism. If, if our sympathies are with anti-fascism, mine are. I'd love to, I, anything that's bad for the fascist cause, in my opinion, during this period is good for the human race. That's my bias on the matter. Um, but nevertheless, the whole question then of uh, what to do about Spain, uh, that's decided um, at this time in this framework. And no sooner was that question decided about uh, saving Buharan, you might argue, and that, that is something that it did. Um, no sooner was that uh, question decided than, um, <coughs> than Stalin and Molotov, and we know this from an exchange of uh, materials that um, Hershchoff gave us in 1956, some letters he released, published. Um, they start to argue that uh, they have to fight against this leadership that uh, wouldn't let them put Buharan on trial. I say, we can say, wouldn't let them shoot Buharan. And they say, we're four years behind uh, in this. Stalin says to Molotov, we have to get vigilant about this. We're four years behind. And what does he mean when he says four years behind? Is this 36? Four years behind is 32. The Uruyutin affair. Now, he wanted to shoot anybody who caused trouble in 32, and he got thwarted by the party leadership. Got to get after them. And now in 36, he's saying something uh, comparable. He want to shoot these people, and uh, we got to get going on it. So that's going to be the line of Stalin Buharan. I mean of uh, Stalin Molotov from this point from this point on, four years behind. That puts the Bukharan position on Spain into sharper focus. Soviets now are following a, what you might call a Bukharanite line. They're helping out the Spanish loyalists, the people we sympathize with, people I sympathize with in Spain, the illegal government in Spain against the fascists. Um, and, um, and that's their line, but does that really work for the line of, uh, even a, the Bukharan line of being pro-French? I mean, do the French even like that line? A strong suggestion that they don't. And Litvinov, the Soviet foreign minister, took the view at that time that all this activity on behalf of the um, Spaniards is causing difficulty not with the fascist power so much as it is with the British and the French, who fear a Red Republic uh, that might come out of the Spanish Civil War with Soviet sponsorship. Can't do that. That'll scare them, scare the wits out of them, and they will rally uh, to the opposite cause, to the fascist cause. So this is in order to try to win the British and the French, in order to try to carry out what we've been calling the Buharan line, Litvinov, the foreign minister, thinks it's a really bad idea to intervene in Spain. So is that, it's, I say it's Buharan versus Litvinov, but you could say it's Buharan versus Buharan. It's the common turn aspect of the thing and the foreign policy aspect of the thing. The foreign policy aspect of the thing, it won the day and they carried out vast purges. It's important to recognize that these purges start out as being purges against the Buharan line and as they get rolling, they turn into purges of Buharan. So that happens in the, in the, in the trials in 1936. They accuse the people, Zinoviev and Kamenev were on trial. They accuse them of making common cause with the fascists. All of this is nonsense, of course, but it's interesting to look at the accusations. They accuse them of making common cause with the fascists. By 1938, when they get around to shooting Buharan, 
which they will, they're going to accuse Buharan of hampering good relations between Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, and being a warmonger. Well, the purges have a change of line. But one constant through all of the purges is the idea that all these people were critical of Stalin one way or another. I mean, you know, put aside all the things they're critical about, and they're all huge issues, as you can see, huge issues. Um, but they're all critical of Stalin, and uh, Stalin has a reason to try to get rid of all of them. And he's got Molotov on his side. Molotov is making grand arguments, ideological arguments, foreign policy arguments, um, su superb arguments for getting rid of them all. And that's what they'll do. They put Boharn on trial in 1936, shot him. That's quite a list now. They shot just about everybody. Boharn. Oh, excuse me, I'm wrong. Uh, so Kolnikov and Radek, in an intermediate trial in 1937, uh, got sentenced to uh, uh, a prison, uh, prison terms and ended up in labor camps. And both of them died somehow after this. We're not sure how Roddick died. Roddick's a biographer, Warren Lerner, looked through all the materials, couldn't find exactly how he, where he died, thinks he died in some camp, who knows how. Um, but at any rate, they've all been got rid of. Stalin's completely on his own at this point. He's liberated from the leadership. He and Molotov, you could say, now can do anything they want. Uh, and they don't have to worry about opposition from within. What do they want? Do they want a pact with Hitler? I would say the thing they want more than anything is to stay out of World War II. Stay out of the war. Don't repeat the mistake the Tsarist regime made in 1914. If the Germans have to fight somebody, let them fight somebody else. Figure out a way, by hook or by crook. Lenin did it in 1918, when he got out of World War I. Get out of World War II. Don't have World War II be against you. I think that's the watchword of uh, the leadership of what you might call Stalin and Molotov, uh, which is going to be the leadership of the regime the death of Stalin in 1953. Um, I think that's going to be the policy from now on. Is that different from everybody else? Are other people eager to get into a war with Nazi Germany? Is Britain eager? No. Is anybody else eager to get into a war with Nazi Germany? It's the United States. God, no. Roosevelt does not want the United States to be involved. He doesn't mind supporting this or that force. Roosevelt is the great, great diplomatist. Among all of them, he is the greatest diplomatist. But he doesn't want, doesn't want war. He wants to figure out a way to keep the United States out of the war. Any good leader has to figure out a way to keep his country out of a war in which you're going to maintain, or I, I should, excuse me, sustain uh, catastrophic losses. Are the Soviets any different? I don't think so. Uh, but that's something that's up for debate, and we can debate it. Uh, I know that many of you will have different views on this, and it's good that we discuss them. Use the forum to give your views on these things, and I'll talk to you soon.